Noah's father gave him his name, hoping that he would be a nachama, a comfort to the community around him. Second point, before drawing it all together. After Tisha B'Av, what do we call the Shabbat after Tisha B'Av, where we're mourning and Yirmiyahu has made us feel hopeless. The next Shabbat is called Shabbat Nachamu. You can hear again, Nun Chet Mem Vav. Be comforted, Israel. Now, Nachama was given the name after our maternal grandfather, Menachem Mendel. Now, Noah did not succeed in comforting his people, didn't really try. Shabbat Nachamu only comes once a year. Todala El, I am blessed with a sister and a brother that always, always, most of the time, always comfort me. Nachama Admev Esrim Lechaim. Mazal Tov. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to work right now, really think for a moment before I share our screen. If you had the opportunity to request God's assistance in helping you to do something or not do something, very, very specific. Now in general, we're meant to ask God all the time for things. But what would be the one thing you would ask for either something to he should help you be able to do and something that you'd like him to help you stop doing? And please share. Now, of course, um, Unmute yourself when you have something to say, and I trust that I'll get some answers, please. Come on, don't be shy. Okay, I have something. It's Sarah. Hi, Sarah, go ahead. I would like him to help me to to help find a kidney for my very best friend because she only has a 2% chance of finding a match. Okay. We wish her well and your request should be granted. Anyone else? I would say good health for good health. That's the most important thing. Okay. Anybody else? Help me create oh. peace on earth. Okay, health. And now we hear from a peace. And while we've just heard from Merle and Abe, I would like to thank you and your spouses, Sheila and Steve for sponsoring this session. I am honored. And next week um, we will wish I, Steve I, a happy birthday. Yeah, our okay. total pleasure. Anybody else? And it does not have to be, don't be afraid to show us that you're not thinking of peace or health. I don't know how else to say it. Anybody? Gloria, you have to unmute yourself. See if you do it now. Can you hear me now? Yes, now. Oh, yeah. Okay. I got a crazy iPad. But I would say if I'm going to be selfish about it, I have a big house that I've lived in since 1965. 
and I'm a pack rat, I have to admit it. And I want to be able to downsize some of my possessions so that my children do not go insane when I leave this mortal coil, okay? <laughs> okay. Anybody's looking to earn a penny from Gloria? If I were there, I would volunteer. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? There's gotta be something. Don't hold back. I, I would like to be able to create an environment again where people actually talk and communicate with each other. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Abe, are you raising your hand? No, Anything no. Else? Just, no. I would I would um I would say I would need need God's help in trying to eliminate bigotry and and anti-Semitism and anti and a lot of antis in the world. It sure. seems like a few weeks ago, that's the last thing you talked about. That's right. It's still on my mind. A man with <laughs> a mission. Okay. Well, good answers. And I'm sure we could hear more. Um the thinker and the rabbi from the uh, mid 19th century, Chafetz um, Chaim. Um, he said the following. He said, we should all have a prayer and a prayer every day where we ask beyond what the normal tefillot are in the Sidur, that we ask for the following. That's the Chafetz Chaim. Master of the universe, may it be your will, compassionate and gracious God, that you grant me the merit today and every day to guard my mouth and tongue from speaking Lashon Hara and gossiping. And may I be zealous not to speak ill even of an individual and certainly not of the entire Jewish people. So Chafetz Chaim was known to focus on what he called central to living life. He doesn't even say a good life. Chafetz Chaim, wanting life. Okay. Just a second. So we see our question, and we had a variety of answers. Uh, Marlene uh, picked one, the one that the Chafetz Chaim, um, as I say, focused on. Now, there are many points to be made about words. And interestingly, again, from this past week's Parsha, Noah. And there's a point being made here that we have to recognize that there are proper words and there is a way to speak. And maybe certain things are inappropriate. So look what it says in this simple pasuk. Of all the clean animals, God's talking to Noah. Of all the clean animals, you shall take for yourself seven pairs, a male and its mate, and of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and its mate. Is there any phrase there that could have been said in a more concise way? We know that the Torah usually is not verbose. 
it minimizes on the amount of words. So there's being a message given here, but read it again. And do you see a phrase there that could have been said in less words? The Tahor, it could have just said Tame. Yafet, the birthday girl. <laughs> Does she sound 60? No. Okay. So you see in the Hebrew, lo, asher lo tahorahi, that is not pure. And in the English, that are not clean. Nacham is exactly right. It could have been said in one word, animals that are impure. The different commentaries explain this to mean, and I believe it's a coincidence with what happened last week, we'll get into that, um, is that even if you're describing something that is not positive or even a person, that there's something not beautiful about that person, you don't use the word ugly, but you would say perhaps not particularly good looking. In the same way here, it would be too gross to even call an animal impure. So instead, the Torah, unlike what it usually does, uses more words. Now that's a simple way of making this point, but it's almost a foreshadowing of what's going to happen later with the Tower of Babel. And taking words seriously, seriously. Now, what do I mean happened last week? I want to tell you how silly I am that at first I thought, well, did this just happen in Israel or it must have been around the world? You had a few hours that you were without Facebook, right? And WhatsApp? Yep. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Now, did you survive? I see yep. some of you are a little whiter. Well, the funniest cartoons were composed here of how are people going to survive without it? But a coincidence that it happens around the same time that we read Noah and this one pasuk that gives us an incredible message about how to speak because we know online so often what is said is obscene, insulting, violent, and, and it's, it's got to be put down. And I know there are people who are working on that. Um, somebody, a contemporary journalist that I've mentioned before, um, wrote about this last Friday in Facebook. People write to her and ask her to post things that she writes. So, you know, for those of you who follow on Facebook, very often people will post that they've made a beautiful cake, they've cooked a great stew, or and show the pictures of it. Well, one day a woman posted a little cup of cottage cheese and a cracker next to it. Not to go into this in great depth, the point being is this woman who could only cut up, come up with cottage cheese for her meal and her family's meal was very depressed that day for whatever reasons. And when she was looking at Facebook, the words and the pictures of the cake and the successful bike ride all of that was impacted upon her negatively. This is just a matter of us, because speech isn't just words. 
But any type of way we talk to another, we should be thinking about it first. And so what this Sivan was saying, you know, in our parents' time, she says, my mother used to cook, she used to sew, she went for her job. And did she report it to anybody? No. It's just a matter of Parshat Noah, the Facebook going off, and us seeing clearly an example of how, this is just a side uh, advertisement of mine, that the Parsha, as we begin it once again this year, speaks to us in the 21st century. Okay. If anybody wants to speak, you know what the rule is. Just unmute yourself, please, and jump in. Now, something I've called negative words. You'll remember that Miriam, Aaron and Moshe's sister, she started, we'll say, gossiping about Moshe the fact that he wasn't with his wife enough, et cetera, et cetera. And how is she punished? Anybody? Leprosy. With leprosy. And even if we're still not clear, um, Simone is right. It could be a disease of the skin, in the home, on objects. And that was a severe punishment. Now, Look what the Chafetz Chaim says about this. Because books later in Sefer Dvarim, God repeats and reminds through Moshe, remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam on the way when you went out of Egypt. It was so significant that he's reminding the Torah, Chafetz Chaim says, exhorted us hereby that we mention verbally always the great punishment, leprosy, that the blessed Lord brought upon the tzaddeket, the righteous one, Miriam, the prophetess, who spoke only about her brother, whom she loved as her soul, whom she raised on her knees, and for whom she endangered her life, you can remember all these scenes, to rescue for him from the Nile. And she did not speak in denigration of him, but only compared him to other prophets. She had said then that other prophets spend time with their wives. And she did not speak so to his face to shame him and not in public, but only to her brother Aaron, privately. And he, Moshe, was not offended by all of this. And the man, Moshe, was extremely humble, more than any man on the face of the earth, in spite of which all her good deeds did not avail her, and she was punished with leprosy for this. How much more so will other people, the fools who are prolix in speaking, great and awesome things against their friends be severely punished for this. So bringing together Miriam and the Pasuk from Noah with the Chafetz Chaim, we are trying to stress how significant speech is and how much time or thought should be given to what comes out of our mouths. Now, you know the song, Mi Ha'ish Hechafetz Chaim. Who is the man who delights in life, who loves days seeing goodness? What must one keen on life do to ensure it? And he answers as we've already suggested, guard your tongue from evil, your lips from deceitful speech, 
and turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Now, when Abe said, peace, you don't just create peace. One of the ways would be leading up to pursuing peace would be by doing the first thing, watching your tongue. All very, very important. And this line is taken from Sefer to Healing. Now, I want you to look at these four terms here. Covenant, bread, wine, and Jewish wedding. What is a common feature throughout all of them? Take a moment. What do they share in common? They're all positive ideas. Yes, they are positive ideas, for Blessings. sure. Something else, though, add to that. Blessings. Instead of saying blessings, use another word for blessings. They're, they're made holy it's through holy. a blessing. Okay. All of these are made holy through words. Words make things holy. Our great teacher, Zikronol of Racha, Rabbi Sachs, says the following. Judaism, like other religions, has holy places, holy people, sacred times, and consecrated rituals, for sure. What made Judaism different, however, is that it is a supremely a religion of holy words. With words, God created the universe, and God said, let there be, and there was. Through words, he communicated with humankind. In Judaism, language itself is holy. That is why Lashon Hara, the use of language to harm, is not merely a minor offense. It involves taking something that is holy and using it for purposes that are unholy, it is a kind of desecration. And that's why, and I will not mention certain words, they are so ugly. After creating the universe, God's first gift to the first man was the power to use words to name the animals and thus to use language to classify. This was the start of the intellectual process that is the distinguishing mark of homo sapiens. Covenant is the word that joins heaven and earth, the word spoken, the word heard, the word affirmed and honored in trust. For that reason, Jews were able to survive exile. They may have lost their home, their land, their power, their freedom, but they still had God's word. The word he said he would never break or rescind. The Torah in the most profound sense is the word of God and Judaism is the religion of holy words. It follows that to misuse or abuse language to sow suspicion and dissension is not just destructive, it is sacrilege. It takes something holy the human ability to communicate and thus join soul to soul and use it for the lowest of purposes, to divide soul from soul and destroy the trust on which non-coercive relationships depend. That, according to the stages, is why the speaker of Lashon Hara was smitten by leprosy and forced to live as a pariah outside the camp. The punishment was measure for measure. What is special about the person afflicted with tzara'at, leprosy, that the Torah says, 
He or she shall live alone, must live outside the camp. The Holy One, blessed be he said, since this person sought to create division between man and wife or person and his neighbor, he is punished. Meaning, the power of words to unite or divide. And what is at stake here is division on all types of levels. Now, I want you to listen to this vignette from the Chaim Chafet's life and make of it what you will, whether you agree, disagree. Okay. The Chafetz Chaim and another rabbi once set out on a three-day journey to take care of a spiritual need in a town somewhere in Poland. Along the way, they stopped at an inn where they were seated at a special table. For the woman who owned the restaurant recognized them to be prestigious rabbis. He had she had them served promptly, and when they finished the meal, she approached them and asked, so how did you like my food? Very good, said the Chafetz Chaim. It was excellent. Oh, it was quite good, said the second rabbi, but it could have had more salt. As the woman left, the Chafetz Chaim turned white. I can't believe it, he exclaimed. All my life, I have avoided speaking or listening to Lashon Hara. And now God made me come with you and I have to suffer by hearing you speak Lashon Hara. I regret coming with you and I am convinced that the purpose of our trip is not truly for a spiritual need after all. Otherwise, this would not have happened to me. Seeing the Chafetz Chaim's reaction, his companion became flustered and frightened. What did I say that was so wrong? He stammered. I, I said that the food was good. I only added that it needed some salt. You simply don't realize the power of words, cried the Chafetz Chaim. Our hostess probably doesn't do her own cooking. Her cook could well be a poor widow who needs this job to support her family. Now, because of what you said, the owner will go back to the kitchen and complain to the cook that the food didn't have enough salt. In self-defense, the poor widow will deny it and say, of course I put enough salt in the food. I, am e I even tasted it before you served it. The owner will then accuse her of lying and say, do you think that the rabbis out there are liars? You are the one who is lying. They will argue, Strong words will lead to even stronger words, and the owner will get so angry that she will fire the poor cook. The woman will, be, will then be out of a job. Look how many transgressions you caused. One, you spoke Lashon Hara. You caused the owner and myself to listen to Lashon Hara. Three, you caused the owner to repeat the Lashon Hara, and that is the sin of Rechilut. You, four, you caused the cook to lie. Five, because of you, the owner caused pain to a widow. And six, you caused an argument, another Torah violation. The rabbi smiled at the Chafetz Chaim and said softly and respectfully, Reb Yisrael Mayer, please, you are exaggerating. You're carrying this just a bit too far. A few simple words cannot possibly 
have done all that. If that is what you think, replied the Chafetz Chaim as he stood up, let's go to the kitchen and see for ourselves. As they opened the door to the kitchen, they saw that the owner was indeed berating the cook as the poor woman stood wiping tears from her eyes. When the rabbi saw what was happening, he became pale and ran over to the cook, begged for forgiveness and apologized profusely for any harm or distress he caused her. He pleaded with the owner to forgive and forget the incident and let the woman stay on the job. He even offered to pay her to keep the cook. The innkeeper was really a kindly woman. And she also wanted to fulfill the rabbi's request. Of course, of course, she said hastily. I only wanted to impress on her the need to be more careful. She is really a fine cook and she will remain here at her job. Rabbi Yisrael Meg Kagan is another, is Chafetz Chaim's real name. He goes on to say, imagine if the rabbi had complimented the cook on the soup. Imagine how events would have transpired if he had said, please thank the cook for the best soup I've had all week. Such is the power of our words to build or destroy. In the following sources, let us take a deeper look at the power of the tongue. So I want you to please tell me your reactions to the ending and whatever else. What do you think about it? Bracha, is this, is this related in any way to the, to the old story about all brides are beautiful? You know, you've, you've heard of that. <clears throat> yes, the debate well, between Hillel and Shammai. Yes, yes. So you should always say, you know, don't, don't necessarily tell the truth all the time if it's going to be very helpful to that person. Okay, uh, <laughs> I hear what I think it is natural for you to think of that. And I think we had mentioned that a while ago. Um, mm -hmm. Are there circumstances different though? Mm -hmm. Between what's the point in telling a bride as she's sitting there a moment before getting married that she is not beautiful? What's the difference between that I'm asking. And this particular case, a restaurant and someone um, criticizing that particular meal. Anyone? I, yeah, can I express that to Merle? Yes, Merle. So I actually think that he did the right thing. I think that there are times when it, it, it's, you're, you're not criticizing, you're just sharing something that could in the long run be a positive addition. So if somebody, in the case of a restaurant, other people might say with a delicious meal, but then say, oh, I'll never go there again. And in the long run, that's not helpful to anyone. So I do think there are times when constructive criticism is okay. He did say it was a good meal, but mm -hmm. why it needed more salt? I mean, I pers and I, I, you know, and I do think there are times when that kind of a comment is warranted. Um, if it was a one shot deal and uh, they were never going there again, or the or it wasn't a business where it could have impact other people, yeah, I could say yeah, it was delicious and walk away. The same thing with the bride. I mean, the bride, it's a one shot deal. You know, the next day she's not going to be the bride. Why would you say she wasn't beautiful on her wedding day? Besides, all brides are beautiful on their wedding day. Um, you know, it's the like same thing with saying a, to a, about a baby. You know, you're never going to say, "Oh, what an ugly baby!" Right? <laughs> you know, I mean, we all have seen some, and but you would never say that because that's not going to be helpful. But I would appreciate somebody telling me that my something or other needed more spice or need more salt or whatever. Bracha, this, this Helen, is, it, thank it, you, Merle. It, Helen, it, it's, 
it's such a subjective thing. Right. I mean, uh, as you were telling the story, I just found it rather, I mean, the message is important and I, and I love the end all message, but I just found it so silly. It's, it's, it's a subjective thing. And, I, and while all this was being said, I'm thinking, for 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 older people, it's better not to have too much salt, and we've adapted our taste buds accordingly. I, I I think there could have been a much better example to get this message across. Um, I I'm not I'm not risking the message. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Is that, is that constructive criticism, Helen? <laughs> well, I, 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 I'm saying that- the Wait, are you criticizing me or the Chafetz Chaim? <laughs> neither, neither. I'm, I'm, I'm only criticizing the example. Okay, well. Uh, okay, yeah, I have a comment. I mean, let me be really clear on that. Yeah. Rocha, it's Brenda. Brenda. I have a comment to make. I think we're focusing probably on the wrong thing because I think, first of all, this is probably a metaphor or- something like that. But I think it's interesting, and it seems very silly and over the top, um, but it does get you to, to think about the unintended consequences of even a very minor comment. Um, because it wasn't a negative comment, as Moreau was saying, and he could have said, it was a really good meal, but for my taste, I prefer more salt, which would have alleviated probably most of the consequences. But I do think we do still have to think about, I'm not sure that the ending, what if he complimented the cook would have made that much of a difference. But I do think we have to think about unintended consequences of our words. Yeah, absolutely. I hear all three comments and I wanna say that I also read this as in the entire book. This look again, it's called A Lesson a Day. And what the Chafetz Chaim in this book that's been re-edited is that you go through it and each day he has a very specific and simple, simple instruction of what to do in this case of Lashon Hara, what not to do. And what Helen brought up is something that I was thinking about as I'm reading this. How do you find that suggestion that you should have this book and the second volume and read an instruction every single day after you say the prayer that I read before on guiding us through how to speak or not to speak? I'm sure many would find what's written in here very simplistic, but I think that's the point, that speak in speech and words we use is not given enough consideration and that we might think, oh, how much harm is that going to do? But maybe that's the point, that it's something we all are involved in throughout the day, as opposed to learning texts about murder Da, 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 which there's a place for that. But he's saying this is something you should focus on every day and gives very specific. And I am sure that there are people who look at it every day, every day. And I wanna give you examples of some of his instructions, okay? So first of all, in text number six, again, I wanna be reminded of what is the motive behind this ill of Lashon Hara talking wrongly. And if we carefully searched our ways, which of the sins have primarily caused the length of our exile, and he believed this, we would find them to be many. But the sin of Lashon Hara, above all, for several reasons, first, for it was the major cause of our exile, exile, this being so, as long as we do not undertake to correct this sin, how can there be geula, redemption? The mm -hmm. sin being so severe as to have caused us to be exiled from our land. 
How much more so will it not allow us to return to our land? And he goes on to say, and for us to be together. The next paragraph talks about, again, this divided our people. And that's what speech will do. It makes divisions between individuals, between communities, between nations. Now, just for anybody who's not familiar, there are considered to be four types of destructive speech. One who bears tales against his friend, transgresses a negative commandment, do not go tail bearing among your people. What is tail bearing? Loading oneself with words and going from one to another saying, this is what Plony so-and-so said about you. This is this is what I heard Plony did to you. Although what he says may be true, keep that in mind. Even if it's true, it's not to be said, it destroys the world. And there is a sin much greater than this, Lashon Hara, which is included in this negative commandment. And that is speaking disparagingly of one's friend, even if what is said is true. But one who speaks falsely about his friend, and friend isn't a Facebook friend, and it's not a close friend, it means another being, is referred to as motzi shame ra, one who gives somebody a bad reputation. And that's when you're spreading something that is false. And then there is a fourth, onaat dvarim, dvarim from the word davar, word, an act of causing pain with words. You're not talking about somebody, you just use words that hurt somebody. Now, earlier we saw that he begins to introduce us to the notion that when you do one thing wrong, it's gonna to lead to another in that vignette. And if he, the one spoken against, were his older brother or his mother's husband or his father's wife, he also transgresses the positive commandment of honoring their having been included in this mitzvah, da -da -da, honor your father and your mother, right? You're not supposed to do Lashon Hara, and if you do that, and towards one of these people, then you're also transgressing against honor your father and your mother. How much more so if, God forbid, he speaks Lashon Hara against his father and mother themselves, where he certainly transgresses the positive commandment of honoring father and mother. Such Lashon Hara especially egregious. Aside from all this, he also transgresses, cursed is he who demeans his father and his mother. Now, what other consequences that were alluded to in that story? And if through his Lashon Hara or Rechilut, he lowers his friend so that he loses his livelihood as a result, see, he took his experience from life and put them into laws. He loses his livelihood as a result, as when though evil heartedness, he publicizes his friend as being dishonest, or if he is a worker as being unfit for his work or the like, he also transgresses. And if your brother grows poor and his hand falls with you, then you shall uphold him, even if he be a proselyte or sojourner, and he shall live with you. So putting somebody out of a job, that appears not to be right. And I have also found it fitting to write of another thing explicitly, for I have found many people to be habituated to it. That is, when someone lectures in the house of study, it is forbidden according to the din, the law, to mock him and to say that there is nothing to his lectures and there is nothing to hear. Now imagine in your heads, you've all listened to many speakers. And in our many sins, we see many people to be remiss in this, not considering this mockery as an esor at all a, a prohibition. Because as Helen said before, it can be subjective. But according to the law, it is absolute Lashon Hara. For through such speech, it often happens that he causes monetary loss to his friend and sometimes pain and shame too. For even if it were true, Lashon Hara is forbidden 
even if true, for what benefit does this mocker and gesture hope to gain by his levity? If he is a sincere person, to the contrary, he should counsel him the lecturer afterwards in private and suggest other ways to present his lecture. For in his present approach, mocking, his words are not attended to. And by this, the above counsel to the lecturer, he would also fulfill, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In any event, he should not render him a mockery in the mouths of men. Now, what situation can you imagine from here? All of us, some, you can be sitting next to a friend, she liked the lecture, you didn't. Different types, different styles. But let's look at it a little differently. Let's say somebody comes to me and says, I know you went to hear this speaker. I need to bring a speaker to my group. Do you recommend? Then I'm put in a position that I don't want to recommend somebody who I don't really highly respect. So am I supposed to be dishonest? Anybody? You know, I can say it in a respectful way. Somebody. I'm just thinking that I was put in this position and I'm just feeling guilty now that uh, it was a very difficult situation because, you know, the, the person is, is going from, let's say, school to school and and speaking to students and sometimes they're uh they're not necessarily the best speaker who, who can grab an audience and uh and you have to figure out a way to uh, to approach it bev if it's you yes. saying this i'm willing to guess that you're talking about a holocaust survivor going to schools am i right <laughs> probably so i would venture to say that there's a lot to be considered there. Yes, you need to have speakers that will engage the students. On the other hand, you're not going to tell a survivor who wants to talk that they can't talk. Yeah. So uh -huh. don't immediately feel guilty. It's not so clear cut as that. You have yeah. to find the best audience for that particular speaker. Yes. Yeah. There's no, yes. There's like the difference between that uh, recommending a well, there's a big difference between recommending a speaker. What happens? Somebody calls you for a job reference. Yes, absolutely. And so, I think there is it, it's difficult. Like I think there are times like when you when you can maybe give the pros and cons. Let, let's go with the speaker. You can say, well, I found this, this, and this, and then let that person who's going to be making the choice decide. Like it's not on your, it shouldn't be on, on our, it should be on the shoulders of the person who has to make the decision, not on the person who's giving the reference. I, I think it's important to be as fair and honest because at the end of the day, it's still subjective. In the, even in a job situation, I've been in that situation where somebody has called me for a reference. The person might not have been the best in my organization, but could be fine somewhere else. Absolutely. And, and you know, and that's it. I think it's a it's 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 an ongoing challenge and, and dilemma, but it's important to be fair. Yeah, I think that ultimately Hafez Chaim does concede that if it's going to be for toelet benefit, then there is a time and a place to say what has to be said. Racha, I think that's important to be heard. Racha, yeah. I, I think that uh, these words ring very true today. I mean, when I think about all that's going on with cancel culture and how words are being used and people are losing jobs and positions at university because of opinions that somebody doesn't agree with. I mean, all of the things that have been mentioned here have become part of our society. And I think really in many cases to the, de to the detriment of the society. 
Well, you began um, in your opening. You said that that would be the thing that you would want to work on, how people speak. Yeah. Okay. Let's look at this. Something else that we haven't alluded to. What do you think of this? First, we shall explain what we are dealing with now. One saying about another that he is not wise. For in truth, there is no attribution deficiency greater than this. For if he were not yet married, if this, Lashon Hara, were known to people, no one would be found who would want to make a match with him. And if he had an occupation, then whatever occupation he had, whether he was a craftsman or a teacher, who would want to join him in his affairs? And especially if he were a teacher of law in Israel, a posse, and one said about him to people that he were not wise, then aside from this being an Esur, forbidden of Lashon Hara, according to the Torah, for certainly if this were accepted by the hearers and publicized in the city, he would be caused a monetary loss for no one would want to go to him for a din or pshara. So what he's saying here, what's the new consideration? We want this guy to get married. You got to do what you got to do to make sure he gets married. So let's just take that lightly right now. Now, when is it permitted to shame? And all of these laws, dinim, that we have set down apply only to a man who is want to regret his sins. Pay attention. But if you have probed his ways and seen that the fear of God is not before his eyes, and that he always persists in a way that is not good, such as one who divests himself of the yoke of heaven or is unheedful of a transgression, which every one of his people knows to be a transgression, that is whether the sin you wish to reveal has been committed deliberately many times by the sinner or he often transgresses, da 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 da, -da when he goes on, if you see that he's got the evil inclination, and he's just a bad guy, the last two lines, therefore it is permitted to shame him and to speak demeaningly of him, both before him and in his absence. Now, in his absence, what does that mean? Does that mean you get to speak to everybody? No, but where it would be called for, because what we have to understand, if there is somebody out there you know a friend is going to a doctor who's made 15 mistakes. You don't have a right to say, I don't think you should be going to him, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Now, also, know whom it is you're criticizing. And know also a basic principle concerning Lashon Hara, that it depends upon the spoken person. So that it's quite possible for one to say the same thing about two people, and to be praising the one and speaking la shonara of the other. For example, if he says about someone whose sustenance is provided by others and who has no problems of livelihood, that he learns Torah about three or four hours a day, he would be demeaning him greatly and would be guilty of la shonara. But if he said the very same thing about one who toils for a living, this would be great praise. And the same applies to other instances of positive commandments. So you have to know who you're criticizing. Now, we know that the person who tells the Lashon Hara isn't the only guilty party. What about the one who's listening? When should you listen? Any Before I read this, when do you think it would be okay to listen to Lashon Hara? Hmm? In the case you said about the doctor, if... if um, okay, you fed Michael. Okay, so look what he says here. And sometimes it's a mitzvah to hear one speaking demeaningly of his friend, as when he feels that by hearing the story completely, he might be able thereafter to show the speaker or the other listeners that what was said about him was not true or other things in his favor. And there are yet other circumstances which it is a mitzvah to hear as one comes before him to complain against his friend for something he has done against him. And he knows that by listening to him, he might assuage his wrath so that he will not repeat the story to others. 
for perhaps the others would believe him and thereby be acceptors of Lashon Hara. And by this, he would increase peace in Israel. But in all of the heterim, what's permitted that we have mentioned in respect to hearing, he must take great care not to believe what he hears categorically, but only to suspect so that he too not be ensnared in the net of the acceptance of Lashon Hara. And how do you do that? It entails three requirements of which he must take great heed so that he rescues himself from the prohibition of the Torah, which inheres in this sin. A, must resolve within yourself with a firm resolve not to believe the demeaning things they say about their friends. B, he should be able to be comfortable, should not be comfortable in hearing these forbidden things. C, must discipline yourself not to reveal to the speakers any movement from which it would appear that you agree with what they are saying. So you gotta judge, you really have to judge. Now, lastly, why would praising, because we even hear that it's better not to praise somebody. Why? Anybody? What could be wrong with saying something nice about somebody? Listen here. One must also take care not to praise his friend with praise that leads to loss. As in a guest going out to the city square and proclaiming to all how lavishly his host entertained him with food and drink and how many pains he took for him. For through this, empty men will gather and converge upon the host and consume his fare. Of one such as this, it is written, he who blesses his friend in a loud voice early in the morning, it will be accounted a curse to him. And from this, it may be derived that the same is true of one who received a loan from his friend and publicized to all his great generosity. For through this many disreputable, disreputable men will converge upon him and he will not be able to put them off. And one must heed his mouth and his tongue not to be suspect in his words and not to be regarded as a speaker of Lashon Hara. And if he brings himself to be suspected, this is in the category of the dust of Lashon Hara. Um, and we all know that when a group gathers around and somebody says nice things about somebody, that's gonna take a second because there are gonna be others for whatever reasons are gonna find it more interesting to dig up dirt on that person. So these are some of the specifics that Chaim Chafetz has suggested to us. Why do I bring you this picture? Has anybody seen this picture? I have claimed that Chafetz Chaim most dislikes about the problems with speech is the divisions that it causes and the pain it gives to individuals. I saw this picture and attached to it, it says an anthropologist thought he would test these African children. He placed a bowl of fruit underneath a tree and told them that the first one to reach the tree could have the fruit. When he told the children to run, they all took each other's hands and ran together. And then they enjoyed eating the fruit together. When asked why didn't they run alone, they answered Ubuntu. How can we be happy when others are sad? Ubuntu means humanity. Words without words, um, ways to bring people together. And if what we would call a third world country can do that, we should be able to. And just one final thought. Consider the unique nature of the tongue. It is partly hidden and partly revealed. It is usually not seen, but it is heard. Another commentator, Maharal, 
concludes that God designed the tongue to reflect its function, which is to reveal the hidden self, one's thoughts, ideas, and personality. The tongue takes these hidden elements from within the person and through words brings them into the open. And so we have some insight into the Chafetz Chaim. So anybody have any more words to share as we talk about words? No? I think it's a, a very important topic. <clears throat> With social media, uh, embedded in all our kids, <clears throat> more so than in our age group, but um, except there are exceptions even in our age group. And what's going on on campuses with the cancel culture where debate is now ruled out, you can't debate anybody anymore. I think it's a significant topic and uh, whether we can ever put the genie back in the bottle and, and curtail Zuckerberg and a few others, <laughs> That's the big question. Yeah. yeah. I would only bring before this distinguished gathering important subjects. Oh. You do a good job. Oh. Excellent, excellent, excellent really, session. Yeah, really, it was very interesting, very meaningful and gave us a lot to work on, that's for sure. Yes, no, Simone, what do you have to work on so much? <laughs> I have work to do too. Everybody has work. We all do. We all, we all do. do. Yep. Yeah. Rachel was great, and I have another meeting. So okay. Of course. Bye. Have a good week, everybody. Yeah. And thank you, Sarah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Rosh, Lema, to your thank friend. You, there, are no words, there are no words. <laughs> there are no words. <laughs> Isaac, <laughs> <laughs> very good. Man, very good. Terrific, Isaac. Okay. Be Good well. Bye-bye. See, See you next Bye -bye. week. Bye -bye.